in reference to any kind of uh, historical data on the artist, it's far more significant to draw a kind of chart of his life and his relationship to his own art. It's far more than to sit around and talk about the light in his paintings or the space or the color. I always felt about Norman that he was someone I grew up with because um, we grew up with a heavy bag, a light bag, some Everglad uh, boxing gloves, a picture of Joe Lewis in the basement. My uncle had boxed for a little while, so we used to get in the, in the, in the backyard and make a little makeshift ring and beat each other up mercilessly. <laughs> so Norman had boxed, and I know his brother had boxed. I've discussed with Norman his life in Chicago in the early days. And he came from the same sort of neighborhood that I came from. It, it was uh, a little street that ran down near the railroad. So we played in the railroad. The railroad was our backyard. And in the front, there was a big roofing company. So I didn't realize it at the time, but all that was preparing me for the art world of New York because it was industrial, it was American. The boxcars with their rust became David Smith, and the, um, the way that the uh, uh, railroad workers painted the switches, um, it wasn't dainty. I mean, they had a couple buckets of paint, red and yellow and black, and, and they would just lay it on. So, so the paint got splattered around on the gravel, and on the steel. After the war, uh, artists like Norman, um, other painters like Joan Mitchell, uh, a whole generation actually of um, artists now were able to have some liberty to travel to Europe. Many Americans went to France and were in Paris after the war, but he was in the French part of that. He wasn't in the, only in the American, he knew French, and I think that made him a completely different person. As I saw it, he never lost his original street element, which the Surrealists say is so important. Well, he was in Paris, and I think he moved to New York because uh, in 56, when Pollock dies, he was with Lee Krasner when she gets the news. I think he felt that like he had to be in New York. He didn't want this part of this action to disappear and him not be there. Even though he, um, you know, he wasn't always uh, uh, gentle in his interactions with uh, the world, certainly had, uh, I think, a feeling of trying to bring together what had been separated uh, in um, the history of art uh, with uh, the avant-garde of the early 20th century. As far as I was concerned, when I went to see the big Matisse show at the Grand Palais in Paris, the thing that struck me more, I mean, about Matisse than anything else was that he had the beautiful ability to leave in some of the great masterpieces his mistakes. He painted over them, but he left them. And when you walked by them, you were quite, it was obvious to you in a beautiful sense that there it was, either a figure that he had painted and he decided no, whether from sitting he wanted it standing or from reclining, but he left it. And you had that feeling of that motion of that figure going from one, one pose to another pose, or the form moving from this space to that form. And that's what I want to do. I began making the uh, trek or pilgrimage up to Vermont uh, at the top of a hill and um, one of the uh, sensations I often had was um, sitting on, in his studio in the middle of the night, uh, in the middle of the winter sometimes, hopefully not, but uh, thinking, this is the greatest painter in the country. I'm sitting, looking at one of the greatest paintings that's been painted in the last 25 years. As the art world changes, he defined his own trajectory, regardless of all the pressures around him. And you can't name those light paintings. You have to see them, and I don't think there is a name for them that we've come up with. 
other than that they're Norman Boone paintings. It was this um, strange sensation of, uh, of this incredibly important, powerful work, which, um, which was uh, not well known enough at the time. If you look at Norman's paintings, you don't, you don't say to yourself, oh, I've seen that before, or I've seen something like that before. You say, what is this? I knew of Norman as a figure mentioned in poems by Frank O'Hara long before I met Norman. And uh, so I actually was, I think I was first aware of his work, aware of him not as a painter, but as one of, the, one of these mythic figures that numbered among O'Hara's friends. His energy was so immediate. His energy was just so immediate. I don't think it was something that, that uh, he could control to a great degree. I think it, he had it in control, but just barely. I don't think he could sit back and make a painting like Mondrian. This is what it's like every morning, same thing. I walk in, I put the paint down, and that, some mornings that's just it. Some artists' work speaks to that, the aesthetic and, and the concerns and, and worldview and, and uh, sense of placement in the history of their generation. Then there are artists who I think are working in a way that speaks more to subsequent generations, to younger artists, to the future. I think he was the kind of person that, he's the, he's the prototype of a kind of person that uh, exists now, he's, he was international. A friend of mine was talking about one painter leaving one gallery and I said, well, we might as well set him up in uniforms, like say the New York abstract expressionist, the New York hard edge painters, the New York neorealist, the New York pop artist, and have everyone have a certain uniform which designates his school of thought and to give him a number in relationship to the style of his work in that school. But then say, for example, an abstract expressionist suddenly decides to become a hard edge painter. Well, then he's got to be traded. Right? And then he gets a new uniform <laughs> and another number. 